Here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide. A mad killer is loose in the city. In every instance, he leaves the murder weapon behind. There are no fingerprints, no clues to the killer's identity. Your job, get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, June 3rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was off duty reporting back in on an emergency call. It was 3.57 a.m. when I got to the basement of the city hall. The carpool. Let's go, Friday. Sorry to call you back in. Couldn't be helped. All right, Ben. Okay, Skipper. What's up, Ed? Double murder. When? I don't know. Found out about it oh, 40 minutes ago. You got any ideas? Roughly same M.O. Was that 6413 Norwich, Skipper? No, 6430. What do you mean, the same M.O.? The same guy. Brickbat killer. How many does this make? Counting tonight, four. We got anything at all? Uh, smudged fingerprint we can't even classify. Sounds like a smart operator. Well, we gotta get him. If we have to shake down the city from one end to the other. Big job, Skipper. Big killer. At 4.26 a.m., we pulled up in front of 6430 Norwich Drive, a small group of bungalow apartments facing on an oval-shaped garden court. Two uniformed officers were stationed at the door to the apartment. Hi, Chief. Hi, fellas. We went inside. Welbert from Homicide was waiting for us. This way. In here. Well, there they are. Yeah. Mother, daughter. Joe, on the floor beside the bed. Yeah, a red brick. <laughs> Miss Hafters, we know how you must feel about all this, but would you please try to answer a few more questions for us? Yes. All right. Oh, Margaret. Miss Hafters, how long had you known Mrs. Diaz and her daughter? Nine years. This November, they moved next door. I remember it so well. We got along right from the start. And as far as you know, the only close friends the mother and daughter had live right here in the apartment court? Yes. Margaret was a pretty girl, but she was no chaser, no boyfriends. Very close to her mother. The two of them, very close. Did they keep any amount of valuables in the apartment? Money, jewelry, things like that? No, Mrs. Diaz and Margaret didn't have much, you know. Very modest income. They both worked. And you can think of no good reason. Oh, no, no. Poor Margaret, poor Mrs. Diaz, lying in there. Shocked. Terrible, sir. Wellberg. Yes, Sergeant. Would you show Ms. Hafters back to her apartment? Sure, Sergeant. Thank you, Ms. Hafters. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Oh, Mark. Oh, Mr. Well, Joe, let's check with Ed. He's back in the bedroom. You get anything from the neighbors? The usual, Ed. No jealous boyfriends, ex-husbands, nothing like that. Boys find any evidence yet, Skipper? I'm still working on it. You got any theories? Well, we know the killings were all done by the same guy. Mm -hmm. Cuts the same pattern out of the window screen. Cuts the same pattern with a glass cutter out of the window. Reaches in and flips the locks. All right, where's that leave us? And before he gets inside, he makes sure there are only women in the house. 
That means he probably watches the house for a few days. Yeah. Once he gets inside, he wants only one thing, to kill. He's never taken any valuables. As far as we can tell, he's never searched for any. What kind of a man works like that? I think the guy's kill crazy. Hey, fellas. Yes, Donner? Here's a break. Two fair prints. One thumb, one forefinger. What'd you get, Pete? Only got nine points. Not enough to go into court, but enough to make him. We'll know him when we get him. Yeah. Found the prints on the lens of the old lady's eyeglasses. Probably knocked him off the night table when he went after her. And when he was done, he put him back on the table. Yeah. Had blood on his hands, see? Yeah. That's funny, isn't it? Why would he go to the trouble of picking up the woman's glasses after he killed her? We'll ask him when we find him. All right, Ben. Joe, might have something for you. We can use it, Link. Hold it just a minute. Yeah. Crime lab, Jones. Yeah. Yeah, all right. I'll tell him. Right, Ed. Backstrand. If you're through checking the victim's clothes by 8 o'clock, you can knock off for sleep until noon. What if we're not through? Take it up with the chaplain. Here's what I wanted to show you. Over here. A couple of casts. Bare footprint. That's right. Those from the Diaz place? Found them outside the dining room window in the flower bed. Take a look. Mm-hmm. Good cast. Size 9. 10. Uh, missing toe there, huh? Left foot, first toe. That's lucky. Well, then the guy took his shoes off before he went in that house. That's the way it looks. You leave any other prints, Lee? Three, with his shoes on. Here they are, here. Yeah. How would you say the guy is built, Lee? Oh, from the impression, pretty heavy man. There's no full length of stride, or I might give you an idea of his height. How about the bricks, Lee? Here they are, all three of them. Use this one in the first murder, this one in the second, this one last night. Leaves them around like calling cards, and there's no way to check them. You'll never get a fingerprint off a common red brick like this, Ben. Surface is too rough. Well, we got an idea of his weight. We know that the first toe's missing from his left foot. That's something. The one we had yesterday. We can check that missing toe in the amputation file, Joe. Yeah. Well, we better get back. Pete ought to have those prints ready, too. Thanks a lot, Lee. Okay, fellas. Say... They post the bodies yet? Yeah, they're doing it now. Same as the first two. The brain? Concussion, hemorrhage. They didn't have a chance. Hold it a minute. Crime lab, Jones. Sure, just a minute. Either one of you fellas. I'll get it, Joe. Okay. Yeah, Romero. Yeah. Good, we'll be right over. They got a make on those two fingerprints. <laughs> Okay, Joe. Single print file. Made him on the index finger. Let me see, Pete. Uh-huh. Take a look, Ben. Yeah. Doesn't look like a killer, does he, Joe? Kind of nice looking. That's right, Pete. They said the same thing about John Dillinger. The name at the top of the make sheet read Carlos Richard Monterey. Male, Caucasian, age 19, height 5 feet 11 inches, weight 165 pounds, dark brown hair, dark brown eyes. Last known address... 1663 Naples Street, Los Angeles. Previous arrest, one, auto theft, February 8th, 1936. That was all. Ben and I had been expecting more. The information on the mama sheet for Monterey was 13 years old. So was the picture. So was the description. So was the address. In 13 years, a man can change in a thousand ways. So can his habits, his appearance, his address. In 13 years, everything can change except two things. A man's fingerprints and a physical deformity. (laughs) Missing toe on left foot. Carlos Richard Monterey. Here it is, Joe. 1663 Naples. Yeah, come on. Somebody's coming. Mm-hmm. Yes? What is it? We're police officers. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, yes. Um, would you like to come in? Thank you, ma'am. Yes? Would you mind telling us your name? Monterey. Isabel Monterey. What is it you want? You're married? Yes. My husband is Francisco Monterey. Would you explain why you are here? 
We thought you might be able to help us. We're looking for a man named Carlos Monterey. I don't understand you. We're looking for a man. We'd like to talk to him. Do you know where he is? Yes. Carlos is dead seven years ago. He's dead, my husband told me. And does your husband know Carlos, or did he know him? He was his brother. What about your husband's parents, Miss Monterey? Where are they? They're both dead. Sometime now. Have you ever met Carlos? No, never. I have only heard of him. What have you heard of him, Miss Monterey? Do not ask me. This is important, very important. Francisco would not like it if, if I told you. It's important, Miss Monterey, believe us. Carlos, he's sick. His mind. For eight years, Francisco has not seen him, not heard from him. He thinks he's dead. But he only thinks so, Miss Monterey. No one has told him his brother's dead. He just thinks so. What else is there to think? Where's your husband now? At his work, the store, Rivera Street near Maine. Grocery. Monterey Cut Road Grocery. Here's your change. Thank you, Mrs. Myers. Now, look, officers, you know how it is. You don't like to let these things get out. That's why I trust you. You can trust us, Mr. Monterey. We just want to check on a few things. Oh, fine. Always glad to help out if I can. Well, can you tell us if your brother was ever in a mental institution in his life? Oh, I know there was nothing wrong. 1923. Got a little bad, so Mom and Dad had to put him away for a while, just till he calmed down. I remember the day. Sometimes... Dumb, stupid kid. What he know? Standing there by himself in the train, crying. The public nurse, stupid way he cried. What do you do? I cried too. I was only ten, Sergeant. I, I saw him go. He was alone. Later on, Mr. Monterey, your brother was released from the state institution. Yeah, he was 16. And then he started running around, playing tough, carried a gun, lived by himself. He never came around. He dropped from sight about... 1938. You haven't heard from him since then? Nothing. Never seen him. Do you know of anybody who might have seen him? Ooh, there was a girl he had. Uh, Anita something. On Soteo Street. Uh, Anita Martin, yeah, that's it. Soteo Street. Maybe she's seen him. Ask her. Maybe she's seen him. Carlos? Carlos Monterey? Uh, not in a year. Let's... March he was in, when I was working at the Peacock, down on South Main. He came in, we talked for a while. That was all. And you haven't seen Carlos for the past two months or so? I tell you, no. Has he written to you? Has he phoned you? Mm. Once, three weeks ago, he phoned. Here. He left a message with my girlfriend. But he didn't call back again. Now, that's it. That's all I know. Thank you, Miss Martin. Here's our card. If he does call, well, you'll let us know. Yeah, I'll let you know. You like Carlos, is that it, Anita? Like him? No, I didn't like him. He was funny, but he was nice. You know, I pitied him. Why did you pity him, Miss Martin? Well, he was a good fellow who was strange. He could smile, you know. He had a nice smile, but well, you could tell he was never laughing. There was something in his mind. Something. Oh, I don't know. At least a year, closer to two, I haven't seen Carlos. No letters, not a card, nothing. He was in the East the last time I heard. When was that? A year ago, January. I was in here. He sent me a calendar. Sometimes he could get along fine, very well. Other times, terrible. He couldn't keep him down. How'd he manage to stay out of jail, went we, Vicente? I don't know. Sometimes he should have been in jail five times over. And you say you don't know of anybody who might have a recent picture of Carlos, a snapshot? No. No, no one I can think of. Okay, Vincent, here's our card. If you do think of somebody, let us know, will you? It'll help. Sure, glad to. If I hear of anybody. What kind of a day is it outside? Hot? Hot. By five o'clock that afternoon, Ben and I were certain of one thing. Carlos Monterey was in the city of Los Angeles, somewhere. We drove back to the office and told Ed Backstrand about our interviews with Monterey's relatives and his friends. Inquiries and requests for further identification and information on him were immediately relayed to the state mental institutions. The 13-year-old picture of Monterey taken from the files was copied and distributed with a note of caution as to the age of the photograph. An APB was sent out. Stakeouts were placed at the home of Monterey's brother, at the brother's store, and at the apartment of Anita Martin. 
A special detail of 300 men was ordered to join the dragnet already in operation. The details at the airport and the bus terminals were alerted, as well as the details at the Union Depot and the main post office. By 6 o'clock that night, almost 1,000 men were actively working at the job of tracking down Carlos Monterey. At 6.30 p.m., Ben and I drew a four-hour relief period. We drove out to Ben's place, and his wife fixed us some dinner. At 10.30 that night, we reported into the office, picked up Ed Backstrand, and we drove out to join the manhunt. We cruised with the dragnet operation until 5 o'clock that morning. Ben and I took turns driving. Actually, the tremendous job of scouring 500 square miles of city for one man was only beginning. Unless there was an unexpected break, the search for Carlos Monterey could wear on for weeks. It did. Night after night, the manhunt went on, and day after day, there was no break. Sixteen days later, on a Sunday night, I went to bed early. I read a while, and then I turned off the lamp and went to sleep. Hello? Friday talking. Sorry, Joe. Get in here as fast as you can. Hmm? What's the matter? That girl Monterey knew. The one you talked to? Yeah. She left her apartment, went to her girlfriend's. Yeah? She's dead. There it is. Ordinary red brick. Found it by the body. How long has she been dead, Skipper? Well, she was seen alive about an hour and a half ago. Got three bare footprints. Good length of stride. Found them down in the lot beside the house. What do they look like? Same guy. First toe missing from the left foot. The same weight impression. Should be about five foot eleven. That checks out with what you got, doesn't it? All right, so it's the same guy. What about those shoes we found, Lee? Yeah, they correspond. They were impregnated with foreign matter. What'd you find? Particles of lettuce leaf, dry onion skin, traces of red cabbage. Maybe a vegetable counter. Maybe. What about the city wholesale market down on Front Street? What about any market in Los Angeles? No, Lee, that wholesale market is big enough to hide anybody. Hundreds of transients work in there. Some of them even sleep there. For a guy like Monterey, it'd be perfect. That's a fair guess. Check it when it opens. They open at 2 a.m. 2.30 now. All right, get back to the office and pick up as many extra men as you need. Get down there right away. Okay, Ed. Now, you know he's a rough one, so watch it. On Monday, June 23rd, at two minutes past 3 a.m., we pulled up at the city wholesale produce market. With the exception of 54 police officers in plain clothes who mingled with the buyers and sellers, business went along as usual. The market itself covered almost three square blocks in the lower part of the downtown area. It was divided off into hundreds of individual stalls by flimsy wooden partitions. To make the search even tougher, the place was crowded. For the first 45 minutes, we had the men circulate at random through the crowd on the chance that one of them might spot Carlos Monterey from the 13-year-old picture. It didn't happen. After that, we started a systematic canvas. We talked to the customers. We talked to the managers of the different booths. We gave them Monterey's description. We showed them his picture. Nobody recognized him. We checked the employment records one by one. Not a sign. Sorry, Sergeant. I'd like to help. I've never seen the guy. Okay, Mr. Snyder. Thank you. We sure pick the sweet jobs, don't we? Oh, yeah. We could spend a year at this. Oh, Sergeant. Sergeant Friday. Yeah, Kamansky. Did you find something? Yeah, at the booth over there against the far wall. Thinks he might have hired Monterey a couple of days ago. Come on, Ben. Where? Over there, Sergeant. You showing Monterey's picture? Yeah, he thinks it might be him. Mr. Fresnetti, this is Sergeant Romero, Sergeant Friday. Yes, I told you, boy, Sergeant. This fellow Carlos, I hired him to help uh, last Thursday. Big rush for me now, so I hired him. You sure he's a man? In the picture? I think so. A little older, maybe. Oh, but I know faces. He's the man. You, you looking for him? You say you hired this man last Thursday? That's right. It's a big rush for me now in the morning. I, I hire him Thursday. He worked uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But he don't show up this morning, so I got no use. Too many men to pick from. He don't show up, I let him go. What kind of work did he do for you? Same as he did for Schiller down there. Heavy work. Uh, moving the stores, they're cleaning up. What kind of produce does Schiller handle, Mr. Francinetti? Fancy, very fancy vegetables. Uh, choice. Uh, new potatoes, uh, expensive red onions... Uh, 
Schiller sells to the big hotels. Does Schiller handle brown onions, Mr. Franz? Oh, only the best. Big dealer that Schiller sells it to the big hotels. How long has this Carlos been working around the market? Oh, I don't know. Is it just like the rest? First he worked for me, then uh, Largo Massini, then a Schiller. Hey, why are you looking so hard for him? He, he stole somebody? He murdered somebody. Him? Mamma mia, murder. Do you have any idea where Carlos lives? Oh, me? No, no. And if he comes back here, I tell him to get out. I got nothing to do with this trouble. No, you'll tell him nothing, Mr. Fresnetti. Here's our card. If you see Monterey again, call us. Say nothing to him. Oh, sure, sure. I'd remember him. Uh, Joe, call the chief at the office, will you? Message just came in. Thanks, Al. Come on, Ben. Yeah, there's a phone booth. See? No, I don't. Where? Straight ahead, little to the left. Oh, yeah. You got a nickel? Mm, let's see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you are. Thanks. I'll see what Ed wants. Two five one one. Two five one one. Chief of detectives always had him. Hi, Mike. Ed there. Ed, take it on extension two, will you? Backstrand talking. Friday, Ed. Move fast on this one, Joe. What's up? Main post office. Carlos Monterey picked up a letter there less than five minutes ago. <laughs> Come on, Ben. There's Ed over there with Welberg. Yeah. Traffic short jammed up around here. Hi, Ed. Friday, Romero. You all set, Welberg? All set, Chief. Spring Street to San Pedro. Sunset the first. Got it covered. Good. What's the story? Post office detail tipped us off. Five minutes after eight, a man answering Carlos Monterey's description picked up a letter at the general delivery window. That was 16 minutes ago. Who spotted him? Sam Lane. He got a look at him just as he was leaving the window. Called to him to stop, but Monterey ran. Lane called me, and we threw a net over the area for six blocks around. And Monterey's still somewhere inside this area? I don't know how he could have gotten out. What's next? Well, I'll give him an hour to break for it. After that, we start a house-to-house search of the whole area. Stop all pedestrian and vehicular traffic for identification. So you're going to jam up the depot traffic? That's cheaper than murder, Romero. Get going. The first hour, we counted off in five-minute segments. Like Backstrand, we felt close enough to Monterey to touch him. But he still wasn't there. The north and south ends of the blockade started to move in, slowly, searching every store, every house, every conceivable place where a man might hide out. In the meantime, Ben and I worked the Spring Street side of the blockade, watching the faces of the pedestrians as they came through, one by one, examining all vehicles and their drivers. The morning wore on, the sun came out, and it started to get warm. By 11 o'clock that morning, Monterey still had not been found. The temperature was 93 in Los Angeles was still climbing. The search went on. At 10 minutes past 2 p.m., Backstrand made the rounds. How's it look, Skipper? Not good. Going slow. How much longer you figure? Uh, I don't know. It'll go to after dark, that's sure. District down here is like a rat's nest. Yeah. Nothing? Nothing. But he's someplace inside this blockade. He's gotta be. Any chance of getting relief for the men in our squad? Some of them been working straight through since yesterday. Uh, I'll see. Check with me around five this afternoon. Thank you, Skipper. Keep a sharp lookout. One slip. That's all it takes. The search went on. At three o'clock that afternoon, the temperature was 95. We sweltered and we waited. At 345, Backstrand sent a squad of men into the Union Depot to search it from top to bottom. There was one false alarm when one of the men thought he saw Monterey slipping out a side door into a taxi. He turned out to be a train conductor. At 25 minutes past four, Backstrand passed along the order to our detail to start moving in, house by house. It was a tedious job, and it went slow. The men were tired. At 5.30, the relief squad showed up. Ben and I stayed on. After another two hours of house-to-house searching, the trap was narrowed down to a three-square-block area, a single block wide and three blocks long. It started to get dark. Backstrand ordered out batteries of floodlights. By 8 p.m., the cordon closed in around the last two square blocks. Lines are all set, Skipper. Ready to move. Good. What do you think? I will know pretty soon, one way or the other. Frank, keep that traffic moving. All right, you two, get going. See you later, Skipper. Joe, let's take a look in here. Okay. Sure is an old building. Yeah. Where'd Kamansky go? I don't know. He's here a minute ago. Oh, wait. There's his flashlight. Down at the end of the corridor there. He's signaling. Yeah, come on. Kamansky? Yes. Down below, Sergeant, in the basement. Come on. Monterey? He's been there, I think. Yeah, this way. 
Where? Over here. Now, watch your step. The light's bad. Here he is. Oh. Says he's the janitor. Oh, my head. He's been slugged. All right, come on. How'd it happen? Can you tell us? Yeah, a man, a big man hit me. I came down to empty the baskets. He hit me and ran. Ran over to the new building. The new building? Is that the one next door? Yeah, just a few minutes ago. Nobody's come out of this building for the past half hour. Every door in the place is guarded. No, no, not the doors. He went through the tunnel. I saw him. Over there's the tunnel. I'll take a look, Joe. Mm. Yeah, the tunnel. Connects the two basements. Same company, old building, new building. The tunnel connects the basements. Joe, come on. Yeah. Kamansky, get out to Baxter and tell him what's happened. Right, Sergeant. And call an ambulance. All right. All right, Ben. Through the tunnel. Watch where you're going. The light's bad. Yeah, it is. That a door up ahead there? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Good. There's a stairway. Come on. Watch the doors. Joe, the elevator. They're both on the third floor. Let's head for the stairs. Ben, come on. One more floor. Yeah, right. Come on, hurry. Yeah. Look, top of the stairs. There he goes. All right, hold it, you. Ducked in the elevator, Joe. He's going down. Well, we'll never make it on the stairs. Joe, look. There's another elevator. The control lever's bent. Let's try it anyway. Yeah. All right, kick the control lever. Kick it, Ben. That's good. All right, Ben, knock the lever back. Come on, quick. Yep. What's the matter? No, it's jammed. We're going fast. All right, let's kick it. Here. There, that does it. Can you reach the door control? Wait just a minute. I'll see. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's still in the building. Both elevators are here now. Yeah. Down the hall, Ben. The office on the left, I think. Yeah. Okay, here we are. All right, keep clear of the door. All right, Monterey, put on that gun and come on out. I'll kill you! I'll kill all of you! All of you! Okay, Joe, let's take it. Watch it, Ben. He's throwing everything he can get his hands on. I'll kill you! Come on! Come on! I'll kill you! Get away! I'll kill all of you! Oh, oh. All right, Monterey. Uh, come on, you! Everywhere you! Everywhere you! Okay, Ben, take him. Yep. Oh. Hmm. Nice looking guy. Clean cut. Yeah. Doesn't figure, does it? What's that? My wife would say he doesn't look like a killer, does he? What's a killer supposed to look like? Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Carlos Monterey was examined by five different psychiatrists appointed by the Superior Court and was found to be sane. He was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 17th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of W.A. Wharton, acting chief of police, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to motorcycle patrolman John Kramer of the El Paso, Texas Sheriff's Department, who on the afternoon of April 26, 1940, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. You're tuned for the stars on NBC.